Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. Uh, Casey Johnson will be presenting on electronic waste dumping in Africa. I know it'll be a super great presentation, so let's welcome her up. Uh, good afternoon everyone, my name is Lauren Casey Johnson, and as Gina said, I'll present, be presenting today on electronic waste dumping in Africa. So what is the problem? Well, Western countries have been sending their electronic waste or e-waste to um, both African and um, Asian countries um, where huge piles of electronic waste uh, accumulate. And I'll be focusing mainly on Accra, Ghana, and Lagos, Nigeria. And you can see um, e-waste piles that have accumulated in both of those cities. So what is electronic waste? These are electronic devices that are broken beyond repair, so they cannot be repaired or reused again. And um, most of the electronic devices consist of televisions, computers, cell phones, DVD and CD, and CD, CD players, electronic toys, as well as household appliances. And these, these um, devices are coming mainly from Germany, the United Kingdom, the United States, Japan, and China. And um, they go mainly in West African countries, um, and those will be the ones on West African and Asian countries. Um, and the two I'll be focusing on are Accra, Ghana, and Lagos, Nigeria, because that's where the majority of e-waste um, that goes to Africa uh, ends up in. So why did I choose this project? Well, I've always had an interest in the continent of Africa. Um, and in early education, I felt that we did not um, receive a lot of uh, uh, lessons about Africa. So once I um, reached my senior year of high school and I was able to pick Africa specific classes. I started taking them at every chance I could. Um, I took one in high school, African American studies and then African American literature, um, sophomore year of college. And then um, that led me to take Africa in science my junior year. And this led me to go on a trip to um, East Africa, Tanzania, where I took this picture from my study abroad um, trip. And it also was where I learned about electronic waste dumping from a guest lecturer and immediately wanted to learn more about it. So what does this project have to do with you or me? Well, I'm sure if I asked you all if you had a laptop, a cell phone, or a TV, then every single hand in here would be raised. And I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, own all three. And we do not treat these products like we used to. Um, decades ago, when your TV or your phone was broken, you would call a repairman, that repairman would come and fix it, and then you'd continue using it for years to come. Now when it breaks within a few years, two to three years, um, you dispose of it however you choose to and then go to Walmart, Best Buy, the Apple Store and buy a new one. And um, also we strive to have the latest and greatest electronics so we don't even use them to their full life cycle. So say you have a, an older version of your smartphone, your iPhone, your Samsung and the new one comes out, um, it's not unlikely that you'll go and get that new one even if there's nothing wrong with your phone. And this leads to seven kilograms of waste being generated per person per year um, worldwide. And although the new digital age has contributed to um, the problem with uh, exporting hazardous waste, the problem with developing con developed countries sending hazardous waste to developing countries has been occurring for decades. One incident was the Coco incident that took place in 1988. Five ships from Italy unloaded over 18,000 barrels of um, hazardous material containing um, things like polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs um, in Coco, Nigeria. And the government was not uh, aware of this. They paid a local only $100 a month to rent out the space. And they paid um, locals only $250 a day to unload the barrels. And of course, they were unaware of what the barrel's contents were. They were actually um, labeled, intentionally mislabeled, as not explosive, non-radioactive, and non-self-combusting. Um, and another issue with uh, exporting hazardous waste was the Cayenne Sea accident in 1986, where a ship from Philadelphia called the Cayenne Sea um, uh, took upon uh, a two-year journey uh, with 15,000 tons of incinerated ash from municipal waste. Um, they took trips to the Dominican Republic, Honduras, Panama, and Bermuda. However, they are turned away at all of these locations, all these ports, because environmental organizations um, learned of this and warned the countries. However, when they made it to Haiti, they um, again lied about what was in the contents. They mislabeled them intentionally as topsoil fertilizer and then dumped 4,000 tons in Haiti. However, once the Haitian um, government learned of this, they um, 
told the crew members to remove it. However, they managed to escape for doing so. And then they tried to dump it in Senegal, Senegal, um, Morocco, Sri Lanka, and Singapore, where uh, they returned away at every port. And then they eventually disappeared. And then when they were found again in 1988, the ship was empty, and they found that the waste has, had been dumped in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Now, of course, um, these two events sparked a lot of outrage, and events similar to this sparked a lot of outrage. So as in a response, um, they created international legislation to deal with incidents like this and pre to prevent incidents like this from happening in the future. And one of those was the Basel Convention that was established in 1989. And the point of this convention was to ban um, developed countries from sending hazardous waste to um, low-income countries. And they aim to reduce the quantity of hazardous waste that's generated and um, dispose of it in an environmentally sound manner, regulate the transboundary um, movement of hazardous waste, as well as implement a regulatory system where exporting, um, in instances where exporting um, hazardous waste is allowed. And under the Basel Convention, they do deal with um, electronic waste and it's banned under the Basel Convention. However, secondhand um, electronics are allowed to be exported. And the Bamako Convention was similar to the Basel Convention, but this dealt um, only with African countries. So the African Union um, band together and decided to ban um, imports of hazardous waste to Africa under any circumstances. And it addressed um, radioactive waste and disposal of waste at sea, which the Basel Convention failed to do. And again, this also um, directly addresses electronic waste and bans it um, unless it's a secondhand product, which it, in which case doesn't count as electronic. So if we have these two international um, conventions, then how is waste still making its way into Africa? Well, it's through a loophole. So um, recyclers in the West are intentionally um, mislabeling the shipping containers, uh, such as, which was like the um, instances with the cocoa incident and the cayenne sea incident. So they'll pad the containers, they'll have, um, They'll have new and used electronic goods that are actually good, and then um, they'll say that that's what the entire container consists of. However, um, behind it is uh, tons and tons of electronic waste, so uh, products that cannot be used again in any capacity. And they'll also use um, old cars, so they will stuff the cars with electronic waste, um, so like these broken TVs and DVD players and cell phones, and then they'll actually weld the door shut to prevent the port officials from going through the contents of the container, and then they'll cover the windows with some type of covering like a blanket. So what happens once the waste makes its way into the West African port? Well, first the crate is sorted, and the goods are the good material, so the new electronics and the good used electronics go to um, the uh, secondhand markets. And um, anywhere from 25 to 75% of the um, electronics that make their way uh, through the shipping containers um, do contain um, good material. But when, when anywhere from, again, 25 to 75% of that is uh, complete waste, that's a huge generation of waste. Um, and the good material that um, might have been broken from, um, the journey or from or like they were already broken but they were shipped and knowing that they could be repaired those go to repair and the broken electronics that cannot be used again go straight to the waste <laughs> and the electronics sold in the secondhand markets they usually don't have a long life um, after being sold anyway um, since they are secondhand and most of them are old so they end up making their way into the dumps within a short period of time and once they're in the dump, um, there are actually people that work in these dumps, so they take apart the electronics and they extract uh, the precious metals that are in the circuit boards and copper wire um, to make money and sell them. And um, of course, th they can sustain injuries doing this because usually they don't have the proper tools to do so, so they're using their hands or, or rocks or simple tools to do so. And then excess waste is periodically burned to keep the pile of waste low. So Lagos, Nigeria, um, the majority of Nigeria's e-waste comes in through um, Lagos, through the Tin Can and Apapa uh, ports. And this comes mostly from the UK, followed by Germany and the US. And um, about 400,000 electronic devices per month end up in the, the three um, biggest waste dumps, which are Alusosun, Igodun, and Irokodu. <laughs> and the largest um, dump site is 41.7 uh, 41 hectares. So that's a huge waste dump site. 
and a low estimate of 100,000 metric tons per year enter in like illegally. So that means that these electronic devices are complete waste. So 100,000 metric tons of electronic waste enters Nigeria illegally each year. And Accra, Ghana is um, another huge location for electronic waste dumps. So Agbogloshi in Accra is the largest electronic waste dump in the world. If you've ever researched um, electronic waste, you've probably heard of Agbogloshi. Um, and about 200,000 metric tons are imported uh, here per year. And a low estimate, this is a very low estimate, because again, anywhere from 25 to 75% of electronic devices are broken. They uh, had, uh, they're beyond repair, so they head straight to the dump. And um, it's located right on a wetland, as you can see in the picture on the bottom. So that means that the chemicals from the um, devices are going straight into the water. And up to 200,000 uh, individuals make a living off of Opera's e-waste. So we have an ethical dilemma here because um, in the U.S., like I said before, we dispose of our products so quickly and reuse is a really important part of um, environmental sustainability. So uh, when products are sent to West African countries, they do have a longer um, life cycle than they would in the U.S. or Europe. And it also provides individuals who usually wouldn't be able to afford these products with um, access to these technologies. And it provides hundreds of thousands of people with jobs. Um, that includes people who um, do electronic repair, the people who uh, scavenge for the uh, precious metals and the electronic material. So it's a huge uh, source of income for both Ghana and Nigeria. However, the, the environmental impacts and human health impacts um, from this are completely devastating. So the environmental costs, um, these are all the chemicals that are uh, released and more from electronic waste. So lead, cadmium, chromium, bromated flame retardants, polycoordinated biphenyls, the PCBs, and other carcinogens and chemicals. And they make their way directly into the air by smelting, so burning down the electronic devices to get out those heavy, heavy metals like silver and gold. And also when um, the piles are burned to keep the piles of waste low. And it makes their way into the water by um, leaching and runoff. And as you saw in the other picture, it's right. Some of them, some of the waste dumps are located directly on wetlands. So that's going straight into the water as well as soil contact. And the environmental impacts of this are loss of biodiversity, soil contamination and erosion, deforestation, loss of vegetation, as well as surface and groundwater pollution. And the human health risks are, are also quite serious. So they, they ingest the um, chemicals through the groundwater since it is making their way into the groundwater. And this is where a lot of the locals in Accra and in um, Lagos get their water source. And also they have direct contact uh, through, to the chemicals through um, the metal extraction and material extraction. Um, and also they sustain like less serious injuries like cuts and burns from um, dealing with the pieces of um, electronics. Also, they breathe in particulate, matters and particulate matter and other chemicals through the process of smelting and burning in the entire, um, the entire cities, or a good majority of the cities are breathing in this contaminated air. And the health implications are very serious, including cancer, death, and damage to all these bodily systems. So what can be done about this? Um, I pinpointed four main solutions. Um, in order to deal with electronic waste, and that's stricter enforcement of regulations, improving waste management, um, cleanup, and reducing electronic waste. So for regulation enforcement, we already have the regulations to properly deal with electronic waste. However, people are finding loopholes to um, make their way around it. So we need to um, have stricter enforcement at every level. So. Um, better monitoring of the recycling companies that are sending e-waste, better monitoring of the ports, and um, better monitoring of the waste dumps. But however, uh, receiving countries, so countries in West Africa and Asia, do often lack the resources to properly enforce these um, regulations since they do take a lot of money. And improving waste management is also important. Usually, um, both, both Ghana and um, Nigeria have uh, severely lacking a waste collection system. So a lot of the time waste is just left in communal dumps, which is how uh, electronic waste accumulates in dumps like these. So formal collection is necessary. A new formal collection system is necessary and formal um, waste 
uh, recycling centers. And the Blacksmith Institute opened um, a former recycling center in 2012 in Agwagloshi, which again is the largest electronic waste dump in the world. And here you can see um, men properly extracting copper wire from electronic devices instead of using their bare hands like they would, use, uh, they would usually. And it, cleanup efforts are also important, as you guys saw from the pictures. Um, the environment surrounding the uh, dumps are severely degraded. So the um, waste needs to be removed and the site needs to be remediated. And lastly, the one I feel is the most important is reducing electronic waste. This, this problem isn't gonna, it's gonna keep happening unless we, if we don't change our behavior. So the majority of the change does need to come from us. And that includes using our products for longer, so not getting the new iPhone, whatever, every time it comes out. <laughs> or, um, and uh, manufacturing companies uh, need to invest in technologies that can be easily reassembled and deassembled so that when something breaks in your phone, instead of getting a new one, you would be able to easily take that part out and replace it with a new one. And Google actually had an idea like that. I think it was called the Google Aura phone. And that's a picture of it where you can easily take pieces out and put them back in. However, that project was discontinued <laughs> because there wasn't a lot of interest in it and that uh, they were having difficulties with um, creating it. Um, but if you must um, keep, if you must like uh, recycle a product, like it, it, it's broken, you can't use it anymore, it's important to choose a recycle that is certified through the Boswell Action Network in order to um, ensure that these products don't end up in waste dumps. And I'd like to thank Dr. Freisinger for guiding me through this process. So with China changing its policies about accepting recycled waste from different countries, do you see that impacting waste dumping in other countries? Um, it's, I, I was reading and oh, it's, it's hard to say because a lot of Pe the people that are actually dealing with the electronic waste in Nigeria and in Ghana, they think it's helping more than it's hurting because it does generate a lot of money for um, their economies. You know, people that work in these dumps, they don't think they'd be able to uh, make a living otherwise. And one thing I saw that they, a lot of them lived by, by, which is quite sad, but it was poison or poverty. So am I gonna poison myself dealing with these um, electronics or am I gonna live in poverty and not be able to feed my family? So. Um, the government, um, there isn't a lot of uh, legislation in Ghana or Nigeria dealing with just e-waste. I mean, they do have to make um, regulations under the Basel Convention uh, for their own nation, but right now, like, they, there have been talks about it for years, but it doesn't seem like anything's really going to be done. In my class, you read the book Cradle to Cradle. I did. And that, of course, has, has a, a lot to say about um, design up front mm -hmm. so you can do these kinds of things. Have you noted any electronic firms that are actually integrating that kind of design process in your, in your research? I noted a lot that have started. Like I said, Google, they started the project uh -huh. and they were working on it, but however, a lot of, there were a lot of um, shifts of management and a lot of shifts of um, people dealing with the project and it was eventually canceled so all the ones that i have there have been like a lot of them under works but i haven't seen any that are actually taking place. do you think this is because they they actually make more money by yeah i think having this kind of yeah it's similar, obsolescence in their in their it's similar to what happened with apple how they just came out with how they slow phones down uh, mm -hmm. every, once the new one comes out to prompt people to buy new, I mean, that's yeah. not what they said it was for, but it does prompt <laughs> users to buy the newest, latest, and greatest item, because mm -hmm. why would you make, why would you make something, if people are going to buy the new one, then why, why pass up on that opportunity to make income, mm -hmm. so. So, in effect, yeah. <laughs> much is being done, so it may require a, a regulatory mm -hmm. um, response. Yeah, I think regulation to, is an important part of actually making sure it happens. Okay. Do you cross into any product take back regulations and requirements? So, for example, in, I know the European Union has had some fairly strong product take back requirements, but I, I'm not aware, I've seen it in the automobile industry, but I'm not aware that that has 
really made a difference in the electronics industry there? Yeah, so there, there are a few like programs. Um, I think it's LG that has one where you where like they inform their users about ways to recycle their products, but there's not any like right. There's not you're not you don't have to. So people usually don't. And the U.S. government, um, they created a piece of legislation that um, I don't remember the name, but but. Uh, it's so that they would properly recycle and reuse their um, old uh, computers since they do, of course, have a lot of them. So um, there are some companies and governments that are working to um, have t product take backs, but it's not widespread or like really enforced that much. And this is, it's not really in the scope exactly, but are you familiar with what happens at JMU? JMU, you can put electronic items into recycling bins. And then what happens? Batteries too. What do you have any idea what happens during the I do not. I was I that's that's not something I looked at. It would be interesting to to see where how if we're walking any kind of a talk here. So. Mm -hmm. I can actually answer that. Sorry. <laughs> so the well, batteries go to the South Main recycling facility, but large pieces of electronics, professors and faculty have to request special bins and they pick it up and send it to that facility on South Main and then it gets Sent to computer resellers in Tappahannock, and from there they don't know. Okay, so that's, from there, that's your unbroken material. Yeah, so yeah. they maybe give it to schools, maybe sell it out. Hopefully. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, guys.